Hello everyone, this is the talk coming to you from Iraq with me, Ahmed Khalid. It is my pleasure to welcome Professor Richard Sakwa to the first episode of the podcast. Richard Sakwa is a British political scientist and a pro former professor of Russian and European politics at the University of Kent, a senior research fellow at the, at the National Research University Higher School of Economics in Moscow, and an honorary professor in the Faculty of Political Science at Moscow State University. He has written many books about Russian Central and Eastern European communist and post-communist politics. Richard Sakwa, welcome to the podcast. My pleasure. So if we start chronologically from late February last year, uh, up until now, there has been multiple attempts to mediate between Russia, Ukraine, and on NATO and the US in a larger aspect. What's the main, the main reason that uh, these attempts have failed and why not resuming the negotiations? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, there, there have been mediation attempts, notably by Turkey, one has to say. Uh, and uh, early on in the war, they led to what was an outline agreement, uh, the Istanbul uh, Agreement of the 29th of March 2022. Uh, and uh, it seemed to be a platform which uh, could have averted the continuation of the conflict. Uh, we know that Putin certainly said that uh, he was willing to engage in negotiations. Uh, and initially, Zelensky, uh, the president of Ukraine, also seemed to be open. Uh, however, for one reason or another, including, uh, it seems, that Boris Johnson, the British prime minister at the time, basically dissuaded uh, Zelensky and the Ukrainian leadership and said that they have to fight on, uh, and th that ended, and that was the main uh, moment in which we felt that there were negotiations possible. Of course, uh, Moscow has said consistently since then that it is open to negotiations. The Ukrainians have uh, also said that the door is open, but they have on a number of occasions established conditions which basically preclude um, negotiations, certainly from Russia's perspective. You can understand the Ukrainian position, of course, because it's their territory which they're losing. Uh, and of course, as I say, there have been mediation attempts. But what is uh, uh, astonishing in all of this is the failure of the United Nations to be more active as a peace broker. It shouldn't really rely on President Erdogan or anybody else, uh, the Iranian leader or even the Chinese leader. It should be certainly the United Nations far more active, uh, but maybe a, some sort of special representative should have been appointed. And also, of course, the role of the European Union has turned out to be entirely uh, negative from the perspective of peace negotiations. Uh, and in fact, uh, the commission under Ursula von der Leyen has been one of the most militant, hawkish bodies. Effectively, uh, it, I mean, critics would argue it's been taken over by the most warmonger, uh, hawkish elements, that's the Poles, and the Baltic republics. So in terms of the perspective for negotiations, it seems absolutely minimal at the moment. Various attempts to put forward the idea that there have to be negotiations. For example, Elon Musk, who uh, made his famous intervention nearly a month ago, uh, and more recently, Henry Kissinger, a classic realist who basically says, look, um, it's very unlikely that the maximalist demands by U of Ukraine, certainly to take back the Donbass, uh, and Crimea is unlikely, and that there simply has to be a ceasefire. I mean, I would possibly phrase it not even a ceasefire, an armistice, uh, just to stop the fighting and the killing. Unfortunately, this is unlikely to happen, and there's much speculation, uh, certainly uh, amongst American military experts, that Russia is preparing a major offensive, possibly in the winter, possibly in the spring, after the thaw, uh, and of course, um, mobilizing the 300,000 reservists, uh, half of whom have been deployed already to uh, Ukraine, does bolster the forces. Of course, this is why we saw a famous uh, a big article just a few days ago by Condoleezza Rice and Robert Gates, who said time is not on Ukraine's side. And that's why they're rushing in more armament. As we know today, the United Kingdom is talking about sending Challenger tanks to Ukraine. The French are calling on the Germans to send Leopard tanks because clearly the Ukrainians, uh, despite the language, you know, and the Russian retreat from Kharkov and Ersan, 
is in a position, it seems, to launch a major offensive, whereas the Ukrainian losses in manpower have been absolutely enormous. The absolute meat grinder around Bakhmut and Solidar and uh, all along the front there, uh, and they're simply not replenishing it, whereas Russia is... uh, has effectively the tactic has been to, you know, I mean, of course, the Kiev has a very different view of these things, but seems to be um, to allow Ukraine to exhaust itself and then have this counteroffensive. So, in short, both sides feel that by continuing the war, their negotiating position will be strengthened. So recently, we have seen a shift in momentum, militarily speaking. Not only due to the fact that Ukraine, the Ukrainian army lost Solidar, but also, as you mentioned, that the, the reports talk about certain preparations from the Russian side to start a, la- a larger scale offensive. Yet on the other side, we see that Germany and France and the US uh, co- continue uh, to provide uh, Ukraine with tanks uh, and armaments and uh, Missile, missile, uh, missile defense systems such as the, the Patriots. I mean, I, I don't see the point of uh, not not sitting on on the, t- on the table and neg- start the negotiations. Yet I'm not an expert. You are. Do, do you see any point of this? No, I don't. Uh, I mean, I think that the first thing we should think about is the appalling loss of life, uh, which for for little gain, because at the moment it seems that every small town in the do- in the Donbass, is uh, is an equivalent to the Kievian Stalingrad, not to give up an inch. And as we know in Stalingrad, how the von Paulus's German Sixth Army was basically hundreds of thousands of uh, German soldiers were captured and killed. Uh, and it seems that every little town is a Stalingrad because obviously, if the Ukrainians were seen to be losing momentum on the military front, then the pressure for them to come to the negotiating table will intensify and this is something that the Kiev regime uh, doesn't want to accept because it will mean effectively the loss of territory and that's you know I can understand it but uh, you know there's a reality of war and the reality of war it, it means accepting uh, the facts on the ground yeah so again the problem here is that many commentators especially in the western media western mainstream media i mean still say that uh, this is the war of Putin and so on and so forth. I mean, there, there's a clearly a much deeper element than the simplicity of uh, Putin's war and, uh, and this rhetoric. Of course, you know that, that there is a Eurasian project that was theorized of in Dugin's books, the Eurasian mission and the foundations of uh, geopolitics. And many reports say that, that even Putin is a moderate am- among the, the, the rest of the bureaucrats, among the Russian ruling elite. What is your take on this notion? Absolutely. This has been one of the key issues for the last decade or so, uh, that they've personalized what is a rather more substantive structural issue. Because don't forget, it was Gorbachev and then Yeltsin and Putin. All of them have opposed... Well, NATO enlargement, of course, is a symbolic uh, element. I mean, it's practical, but it's also symbolic because what it actually uh, is symbolic of is the expansion of what I nowadays call the political West. Now, the political West, this is the European Union, this is NATO, uh, and indeed the full cultural, the full shebang, if you like, uh, of the political West. And the political West was established during the Cold War. Uh, It's a US-led political uh, formation, including, of course, Japan and uh, allies in Asia. And, And this political West, after the end of the Cold War, refused to uh, give a place to Russia in the post-Cold War order, other than as a, according certainly as Moscow perceives it, as a subaltern, as a subordinate, to become, in other words, like Japan or Germany after the war. But they lost the war, and Russia, of course, refused to believe it had lost the war. And, of course, the sharp point of it all was and is, of course, NATO. But, you know, then, of course, Ukrainians would say, look, there was no perspective of Ukraine joining um, NATO anytime soon. And that was certainly the case. But this is why I use it rather more 
widely this notion of a political West, because, as we know, the United Kingdom and the United States was arming Ukraine to the teeth uh, before the war, that uh, as far as Moscow was concerned, this was, uh, and Dugin says it, that the war was inevitable. And indeed, some of the former moderates are now saying that Russia was pushed into a corner. I'm thinking of Dmitry Trenin in particular, the former head of the Carnegie Moscow Center, uh, and others. I mean, maybe I'm slightly misrepresenting what he's saying, but effectively, he's saying that this is a war which was forced on Russia. So you're absolutely right. We shouldn't personalize it. And, you know, in this, we have to except that Putin has been the moderate. He accepted that he made a mistake in not launching this war in 2014, in going along with the Minsk Accords, which, as we know, both Angela Merkel and Francois Hollande have accepted was just to buy time. I mean, they may be saying it just to save themselves because they're being attacked as having been duped by Putin in all those years. And they're saying we were never duped. We were just playing for time, which makes them look like very wise statesmen. When, uh, But it also reveals bad faith because they were telling Putin um, uh, implement Minsk the Minsk Accords on autonomy for the Donbass when all the time if what they're saying is now true they never really meant it which makes Moscow even more angry and that of course is why um, support for Putin has gone up since the beginning of the war astonishingly it's close to 80 uh, percent opinion polls show this is Levada polls uh, and so on which is absolutely astonishing high level of support I mean I, you know, there is no enthusiasm for the war in Russia, yet there is a certain grim determination that this is a war that, you know, unfortunately must be fought. So, uh, as you say, so Putin in all of this is the moderate. I mean, it's quite factually moderate because we have Prigozhin at the head of the Wagner group and, uh, Dugin and Kadyrov uh, from Chechnya all calling for much, much tougher military action. Yes, you mentioned Kadyrov. I mean, I've heard I've heard this speech after the the loss of West Kherson that he suggested to, to drop a uh, tactical nuclear weapons on Western Kherson after the the withdrawal of, of uh, the Russian army, which is astonishing to hear and uh, put us on the brink of uh, a nuclear exchange. But you mentioned that uh, you see European as a political entity, a political system, an ideology. Do you see that there's an, an ideological element in, in, in this conflict uh, between Russia and and the and NATO, just like the, the old days between the communists and the capitalists, and like the Soviet Union and the US and the rest? Is there an, an ideological element in here? Yeah, there is an ideological element, uh, not in the old-fashioned Marxist-Leninist vision of ideology, but and it's not even the old the Biden line that this is democracy versus authoritarianism, autocracy. What it is, though, is a, a battle between two visions of world order. Uh, the political West uh, believes that its values and its uh, a model of society, which you know, I I, I think there's plenty of good in that model, but uh, the view well, Moscow and many others, of course, increasingly, one has to say the Turkish leadership and Iran and China and many, many others in the global south argue that, you know, however fine the political West may be, we don't want first to be subordinate to uh, the United States and its arbitrary and extraordinarily militarized form of international politics. You know, the, the defense budget, $800 billion with possibly 300 billion on top of that for the security services. I mean, this is just uh, so out of scale and also the manner in which it conducts politics, which is always uh, manipulating, dividing, generating conflict. I mean, this is the criticism, uh, generating conflict. Uh, whereas on the other side, this model of world order. So you have on the, the political West advancing this notion of uh, you know of democratic internationalism that all states must um, you know that the advance of the political West geopolitically is couched in the language of the advance of democracy. That's ideological for a start. And once you start entering this ideological framework, you can't do diplomacy. And the same applies on the western on the eastern side. We have the emergence now, and, uh, just the beginning, of a political East. Uh, Russia is the spear tip of this. China is standing firmly with Russia, not with arms, but diplomatically uh, and um, perhaps, you know, buying oil and energy economically. Of course, 
uh, trying to avoid um, being entrapped in US-led sanctions, wisely and sensibly so. But nevertheless, the emergence of a political East is the major turning point of our century, uh, that basically the political West and all of its machines and its endless reproduction of Cold War style politics, block politics, everybody has to align, you know, the bullying of the smaller states and the rest of the world, either you're with us or against us, all of that. Other states say, no, we hold to the principle of sovereign internationalism. The internationalism expressed by the United Nations, the Charter International System established in 1945. We don't want to play your games again. We have achieved, you know, independence, anti-post-colonial world. Uh, and, you know, near you in the north, that's Russia and the United States and France and Germany, again, you at war. You guys can never overcome the logic of war. The logic in East Asia was always different. Sovereign internationalism, the Bandung Declaration, the idea of non-alignment, uh, uh, you know, which is an active, positive stance, non-alignment. We want peace. We want development. We don't want to get involved in your endless wars in the north of European civil wars. Uh, and so this vision of sovereign internationalism, this model of world order, of sovereign devel states developing in peace, uh, and, you know, each getting on, not interfering too much in the, interfer in the internal affairs of others. So that is the ideology. That is where the huge gulf is today. Yeah, this rem reminds me of, uh, of the, the, the book that uh, Dugans wrote, uh, The Eurasia Mission. And that he seeks multipolarity instead of the 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 uni uh, the uni uh, the unipolar world that uh, the United States is the dominant force. Uh, do you see there's a, this is also a refusal from the West, the, the NATO, the U.S. in particular, to a multipolar world like China, Russia, and many maybe another countries that might might emerge and challenge uh, that uh, that hegemony. Yes. You could. That's another way of putting what I just said. Absolutely. So it's the model of a relatively unipolar US led world and a multipolar world with different centers of uh, of influence of power. Uh, and this, of course, includes India uh, and China and Indonesia. We saw this in the G20 meeting uh, in Indonesia and Bali a couple of months ago, where the uh, it was quite clear that First of all, there was a lot of pressure on Indonesia not to allow Russia to attend in the first place, but they withstood it. The final communique uh, reflected the views of the global south to some degree. They refused to accept the version put forward by the political West. So, yes, we're seeing now, you know, 2022, the events from last year, is a major turning point in world history, equivalent to 1945 or 1989, anything like this. Sadly, it puts in jeopardy the whole United Nations Charter International System, that huge body of international law built on it, established, which has lasted since 1945. And this is uh, you know, potentially catastrophic. And the marginalization of the United Nations, which I've alluded to earlier, is one of those symptoms of a crisis of the international system. If the United Nations system, at the moment, the United Nations system is used by the political West as an instrument to conduct conflict rather than to overcome the logic and to find a uh, a pathway to peace. So, uh, you know, we're in a very, very dangerous state because if the UN system, you know, maybe it won't collapse, but be totally marginalized, then we're in literally uncharted water where the war of all against all. I just hope that, uh, you know, this Ukraine war has a potentially you know, it's like a, like a devastating effect on everything it touches. And obviously, first of all, poor Ukraine, but uh, then Europe as well is suffering and will suffer enormously. Because it's not just a question of high energy prices. It's the very ethical normative basis of Europe. European Union was meant to be a peace project. So today it's become a war project. Then what's the point? Let's go back to the old days of EFTA, European Free Trade Area, abolish the Commission, abolish its geopolitical aspirations, which was, you know, the European Union did turn in, as John Mearsheimer says, simply the soft edge of NATO enlargement and NATO symbolically of, you know, US militarism. It wouldn't be NATO bases in Ukraine if they'd gone. It would have been US bases. 
So, you know, all British bases, and they were doing it. They were building, you know, spending one and, nearly one and a half billion dollars on building a navy and the new ports for Ukraine. You know, you don't do, you know, it was basically, you know, NATO without formal membership. Yeah, speaking of Europe, I mean, we have we have seen that Europe suffers economically, especially Germany, which 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 is the main importer of uh, Russian uh, gas and oil. Uh, the rises are, are are peaking. UK also suffering from uh, from this. Maybe that uh, Brexit was uh, a major mistake in this regard. But how, how do you see the role of Europe, like the major the major powers, Germany, France, Italy? What role they can play? I mean, I, I, I've see, seen the, the, the visit of uh, the German foreign minister today, Alina Baerbock, uh, to Kharkiv. It seems that th- th- there's no coming back from uh, the, the, the be- being under uh, the control of uh, the, the US. How, how do you evaluate uh, the European role? Well, don't forget that Germany has a coalition government and the foreign minister, Alina Baerbock, is from the Greens, and the Greens have always been the most vicious uh, hawks and warmongers of the lot, paradoxically, as you'd have thought, that they may have devoted a rather more attention to the climate crisis, the global warming, and other issues, instead of which they're driven by a virulent Russophobia, which, uh, of course, makes them very receptive Polish and Baltic, uh, you know, hawkish perspectives. What this war has shown is the the marginalization of Europe. I mean, I've been arguing this for many, many years. The death of Europe, you know, as a genuine peace project, geopolitical unity. Uh, and of course, the only way to avoid this war was to have had some sort of pan-European framework, uh, which would have been from Vladivostok to Lisbon. Uh, and of course, the United States was opposed to that because that would have decentered Washington. It would have decentered the United States and, you know, all those initiatives were always blocked. And this is, of course, a Gaullist, a neo-Gaullist idea. De Gaulle, uh, Francois Mitterrand put this forwards. Uh, and, of course, uh, Gorbachev, famous common Euro- uh, European, uh, common European home. And, of course, Putin also took up this idea in 2008 uh, in his famous speech in Berlin. But, of course, all attempts at pan-European security building of an, on a genuinely equitable basis for the example, the NATO Russia Council established in 2002. Uh, it was designed, intended to overcome the old 19 NATO members versus Russia, 19 plus one, and to make it, you know, 20 equally. But all Russian attempts to genuinely put on the agenda issues of pan-European security uh, were blocked by Washington explicitly. I mean, it's not, I'm just not making this up. Time after time, there's plenty of excellent studies which demonstrate this. And so, uh, of course, the pan-European ideas died. That leaves a lump Western Europe, uh, which was, of course, always a subordinate to the United States. And what this has shown is even more tragic, France and Germany and Italy to a lesser degree, the serious, sensible countries, if you like, uh, in Europe, they, their diplomacy has been completely marginalised. I, you know, I very much commend and laud both uh, Olaf Scholz and uh, Macron, Emmanuel Macron, uh, in the weeks and months before the war to try to go to Moscow to negotiate. But they had nothing to say. They could say nothing because decisions were going to be taken in Washington. So this was the tragedy. These formerly great powers were shown to be utter marginal figures. And so this war... As I say, it destroys everything it touches. And one of the things it's touched is the credibility of the European Union. It's become a a war fighting rather than a peacemaking body. It's destroyed Germany and France as any serious normative powers, instead of which they've now been become totally trapped. I mean, they're both talking in terms of negotiations, of course, and I wish them success. But there's no substantive basis. So the war will end when Washington decides it's going to end, unless it ends with a massive military victory of one side or the other. And at the moment, you know, as you know, so many commentators argue, this is, a, this is a war that Russia cannot lose. I mean, it cannot lose if it wants to survive in its present state. Of course, it can lose. If it does, then we're into, again, 
uncharted waters. You know, already we have commentators like, like Alexander Mottil, this American professor, who is saying we should now get used to the idea of the collapse of Russia. Well, perhaps, but a nuclear armed state disintegrating? Well, you might as well get used to the idea of the end of humanity, because that's what it would mean. Again, this isn't blackmail. We're just taking, you know, if you're talking about facts, uh, why should facts be, you know, that you're fighting a nuclear power? Uh, you know, it's not blackmail or appeasement to accept the fact that you're playing with fire and fire has a habit of getting out of control. Actually, you, you reminded me of uh, an article that was written on the, I think, on the foreign policy of, uh, by Anatol Levin. Which he, he suggests that the, the loss of uh, the Russian army in this war will be the equivalent to the loss of Germany in the First World War, which led after, thereafter to the emergence of uh, Nazi Germany and the Second World War, uh, which is horrifying, actually. Uh, however, how, how do you evaluate uh, that, that uh, the notion that uh, sees uh, the that says that, that this is a good opportunity to, um, uh, to Europe to emerge as uh, an independent uh, project uh, and uh, unite uh, them more and stay away from uh, the, the hegemonic uh, power, which is uh, the United States. How do, you, how do you respond to this notion? Yeah, at a super, superficial level, absolutely, of course, uh, it has. I mean, it's, uh, that's indisputable that Europe has lost its subjectivity and it's now been folded into a US-led political West even more than before, that in the past it had a certain degree of autonomy in this endless talk of strategic autonomy, of course. And it, yes, it certainly has. Um, it, and of course, the idea of Sweden and uh, Finland joining NATO is again yet a, sim a symptom of that. Oh, absolutely. This is what I've been saying. That, uh, but it isn't. The uh, point is, is that Moscow would then answer, well, this has been the case for the last few years anyway. You know, even if Angela Merkel and Germany were not pursuing the Minsk Accords in the Normandy format of France as well, uh, in good faith, and they were basically accepting the Washington Kiev line that this was not going to be an agreement that should be implemented, then. Uh, you know, Chomsky is wrong because it has happened a long time ago and the war has obviously only made even more obvious uh, what was happening anyway because both Sweden and uh, Finland have long been cooperating and working with the political West deeply embedded in it. So it's misleading to say that because you could turn that argument upside down and basically say this war was necessitated by the fact that this political West was giving absolutely no space for Russia to develop. Uh, you know. But then, of course, you could say, why should it be a great power? In what forms should this great power be uh, accepted? And if, it, if Russia's definition of it as a great power means subordinating its neighbors to itself and recreating an empire, then that's quite obviously unacceptable, including to me. But I don't think that was what was going on. Uh, what was going on, as you suggested, the advance of the political West all the way to the, including possibly Georgia and Ukraine, uh, would be surrounding Russia. So any general, anybody sitting in Moscow, I mean, the argument has been made often if, uh, you know, if Russia wanted to build bases in Mexico or Venezuela, as we saw with Cuba in 1962, uh, you know, the United States didn't take kindly to it. And you know, I also say if uh, China wanted to, or the Shanghai Cooperation Organization wanted to build a base in uh, in Ireland, I think that very quickly you'd find that this London's uh, debates about freedom of choice uh, would be forgotten and the geostrategic concerns would come to the top. Again, this is not an argument to say that neighboring states should be subordinate to a big neighbor. But what it what it is an argument for is the one I've been making for you know many decades is that right from the start there should have been a more inclusive and genuine and more concern listening to Russia's geopolitical concerns because as you suggested, Putin is one of the more moderate. He was of course at the beginning wanting to you know and Yeltsin did saying look we've got this security dilemma let us join NATO that would solve it immediately. But of course, that would have decentered Washington. Um, so, um, yeah, so, so clearly the West is consolidated, but this is a temporary phenomenon. 
first of all, there will be divisions coming up soon. But more than that, going on to our next block, but you know, more than that, we're seeing now this emergence of a political East, more consolidated, also more being alarmed and warned by this, you know, the unprecedented sanctions against Russia in this war by the political West. Uh, and so China is taking note, India is taking note, every country in the global South is taking note. Look, this is how the West abuses its dominance. This is the way the, the United States uses its dollar diplomacy or, do, or dollar club to, uh, you know, to beat everybody else into submission, as they would see it. So uh, absolutely, you have a counter movement. So what we're seeing is the ultimate strategic collapse, catastrophe of the political West. What it's managed to do is unite most of the world against it. So, of course, then people say, well, look at United Nations votes. Well, of course, that uh, they quite rightly condemned uh, elements, uh, such like, is not the votes, it's what they're doing and what they're saying. No one likes to be forced to choose, but clearly the political West has discredited itself again. How on earth could they have turned Russia, which was looking for a peaceful order, uh, into such an enemy? They made this enemy. Vladimir Pozner makes this argument. So many others. This is makes this war so senseless and genuinely stupid because it was easily avoidable. And so we should be very careful not to repeat the arguments of the extreme ultra nationalists which dominate in Kiev. And, you know, again, the rest of the world is watching how on earth this major political West, the United States, being no more a cat's paw. Uh, in the hands of the extreme ultra-nationalists in Kiev. I mean, the agenda in Kiev is not the same as that of the political West. Uh, I mean, its concerns, its issues, who the political West, Washington, should be, you know, have much larger concerns. But at the moment, its foreign policy seems to have been hijacked by extreme nationalists in Kiev. And there cannot be anything more dangerous than that. And their goal is to destroy Russia. It's been the goal for the last 200 years. And they see this as an opportunity when you have such, well, I, I, I won't use delicate words, such stupid Western leadership that they've been able to take advantage of it. Of course, it's a dreadful war. And, you know, it has to stop and we find a way out which is satisfactory to all sides in this. So there's not a justification for war. It's a justification for an anti-war position and a war and a move towards peace in one form or another. Yeah, speaking of the, the BRICS countries, I mean, there are many countries that, that are in line to join, not only Egypt, um, Saudi Arabia, even Saudi Arabia wants to join the, the BRICS countries. But um, I, I will talk to you about it from another point, which is kind of historical, uh, but I want to, to see your response on how that apply on the, on the, the present and on the future. Uh, and then the 50s and 60s, there there was, uh, there were the, the non-aligned countries that was uh, established by Egypt's Na Jamal Abdel Nasser, uh, India's Nehru, uh, Yugoslavian Tito, Tito, uh, and so on. Is there a possibility that uh, the non-aligned countries that m might re-emerge again and organize themselves? Because it seems obviously that that the world the world is. Uh, is heading toward uh, superpower politics uh, ascending again, and it, it will be split between uh, two, 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 two or three major powers. Um, how, do, how do you evaluate uh, this notion? You know, what we are seeing is, as I say, the expansion of the political West, which uh, is being countered by, you know, a very loose, at the moment, uh, when I talk about a political East, it's, you know, we're talking about the BRICS organization, we're talking about a Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Both of those bodies, for example, a Shanghai Cooperation Organization, has got an ever-growing list of countries which want to join. We're talking about Argentina, Egypt, and possibly, and many, many more. Uh, and this is quite astonishing. So, uh, because they feel that this model of international politics uh, advanced by you know, the political East, I say it's a very nat na nascent, it's not the simple counterpart of the political West. The political West was forged in the Cold War. It's got major military, economic, normative, and other power, soft power, if you like to use that term. The political East is precisely working in a different way. 
So it's trying to overcome the logic of Cold War, not to perpetuate it simply by conducting another Cold War, by establishing itself as the analogue of the political West. As for the rest of the world, the political West is a very dangerous and unstable body because worse than that, they can all look and see inside the political West. And what do you see? You see globalization's uh, advantages and benefits, which are obviously huge in all sorts of ways, have gone to a very, very narrow layer where they also look at the United States and see a an out of control military industrial complex. I mean, this whole war in Ukraine, of course, you could argue, is simply to ensure that Lockheed Martin, that Raytheon, Boeing Corporation, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, their, their military wings will have these juicy uh, contracts. And we see this now. Almost no oversight, nearly 100 billion, obviously much of this towards civilian purposes. But, you know, a military budgets, you know, ballooning out of control with minimal, minimal oversight. This is not a model. The United States with, you know, how much, uh, well, nearly two trillion dollars in debt. <laughs> so, uh, you know, one point seven trillion. It goes on and on the list. And of course, the massive inequality, the access to health care, you know, the proportion of our populations living in poverty. But we've got the money to fight a war, an unnecessary, stupid and avoidable war. Well, I, I think that you'll see we've seen some demonstrations in Berlin and in Italy over the last few weeks against the war. Well, this will increase. Probably not so much in the Anglo-American heartlands because they, the media is so dominantly pro-war and very few alternative voices condemning the war and the stupidity and the, the way that this can only end badly. I mean, the long, every side, both sides think that the longer the war goes on, the better their position. There is no good position at the end. The destruction of Russia, which, you know, obviously the hyper-nationalists in Kiev want to see at the hands, you know, using the West as a cudgel uh, to beat and destroy Russia. Well, is that going to make the world a better place? 144 million Russians uh, immiserated and destroyed, they're ha living? No, you know, this again is not justification for the start of the war, but that we are where we are. And I think that it takes us, we should take a sober, sensible view of analyzing where we are today, which is what I hope we're doing in this discussion with you today. Uh, my final question will be about uh, the, resol the resolving of uh, the, this uh, conflict and this uh, war that potentially could, le could lead uh, to a, a major war between uh, superpowers, militarily superpowers. Uh, how, how do you see the, the path uh, to resolve uh, the, this uh, problem? And Professor Jeffrey Sachs, for example, suggested that, uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs of Columbia University, suggested that we follow the path of JFK in, in the Cuban Missile Crisis that we have to activate diplomacy, not peace treaties. Uh, how do you evaluate that? But on a footnote, this war definitely reflected on the Arab world. But uh, unfortunately, sadly, it came with uh, a notion, if we can say, of accepting authoritarianism and the undermining of human rights and democratic governance. This is a footnote that uh, this that wars... Uh, only brings uh, only brings uh, difficult options. Uh, I mean, I, I would love uh, to hear uh, your response about diplomacy or peace treaties. I very much agree with that. It is diplomacy. Can I go back before we turn into this? Go back to your earlier point about um, you know the many people who consider the political West, you know, as hypocritical and in, and pursuing double standards. Uh, of course, that is the case. Um, but uh, can I stress that this rejection of the political West, in my view, should be accompanied, and I say this vis-a-vis -vis Russia as well, uh, that it should be accompanied by a reaffirmation, not of the principles of so-called liberal international order, but of the United Nations. And that those principles, if you are a member of the United Nations, now 193 states, then those principles are not American principles, not British principles, not Western principles, but universal principles, which we all can fight for, for human dignity, for development, for peace, and for the dignity of all in a society. And for, for it's very important that this includes uh, women's rights and 
minority rights and children's rights uh, and and everything else because these these are you know for people to live in dignity but also for people to live in dignity requires social changes to ensure more equality more control over the military industrial the, the hawks which are dominating in washington and london that we can actually move to a society which is more just and that way we can fulfill the aspirations of the charter international system at the end of that devastating second world war where millions died where societies were left devastated the fact that the political west and russia have led the world once again into a situation where there's devastation and wreaking now unfortunately in ukraine but in the middle east across many countries there uh, as well yemen for example is a conflict which is you know when you look at the yemen it's so catastrophic and you know this the american anglo-american support for saudi arabia's bombing and killing and sanctions and bulk and embargoes campaign in yemen is you know unutterably on a scale far worse than anything which has taken place in ukraine so far so when i walk around here and i see ukrainian flags uh, on you know universities and public buildings you know we joke all the time where's the yemeni flag where is the yemeni flag where is the syrian flag where is the iraqi flag where is so many other flags where there's conflicts and wars and uh, so on so yeah but so the rejection of western hegemony does not mean the rejection of those universal principles and that's why i think we should all fight for to say these are universal and that each society has to work to fulfill it so that everyone in your society in our societies can live in dignity and that requires, as I say, an end to war so that you can start building peace orders and building societies, you know, to rebuild cities and to make people live comfortably and normally. And where instead, unfortunately, we're heading more and more into a whole miasma of war. We talk about Ukraine. As you say, the Middle East, we're probably heading for another major war, given the nature of the Israeli government today. Uh, you know, this is intolerable. You know, it's, 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 it's intolerable the way this is going. And we're just at the beginning of his new term in office uh, with his allies in office. So, um, yeah, I've forgotten the other part of the question, but certainly that for me is fundamentally important. Yeah, actually, my question was about diplomacy or peace treaties. I hope I couldn't agree more, actually, with what you said. Uh, but my question was in regard to how do we resolve uh, the, this uh, conflict? Do we uh, follow diplomacy like JFK and the Cuban Missile Crisis or peace treaties? I, I agree completely with him. Uh, I'd, I'd go uh, perhaps even a little bit further. Uh, after the, his lesson of the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, this was October 1962. Uh, and then you'll recall that in June 1963, uh, uh, Kennedy's fantastic commencement address speech i think at the american university in washington dc uh, was an absolutely visionary speech in which he argued in some that peace is a process that you, it isn't something uh, simply a peace treaty it's a process it's a beginning you begin to talk and then gradually if you begin to listen because the whole point of diplomacy is yeah, dealing with difference dealing with people you don't agree with you can't and there's no much point doing much diplomacy with countries with you you know there's no divisions and of course that also means you know i i've been talking you know at the very basis of all of this this notion which i've been developing elsewhere is the notion of political dialogism which only political dialogism is a process in which both sides change and that is the tragedy after the end of the cold war in 1989 is that basically the political West was insisting that one side changes Russia, Ukraine and all the post-Soviet and other states. Uh, of course, they can change and we want to see them more closely aligned with the UN Charter. But at the same time, the West, political West also needed to change in giving space for the countries like Russia to develop. And they were not given space. They were not given time that uh, you could say, of course, you blame Putin for his authoritarianism, for falsifying elections and so much. And, you know, I condemn all of that, of course. Uh, 
Um, but, you know, in, in some ways, these systems feed on each other and, you know, you end up to where we are today. So it, it has to be peace as a process. You begin negotiations, at least a some sort of enforceable ceasefire or a genuine, you know, as I say, I don't even think a ceasefire, just an armistice. There's, um, there's, we're not even close to a negotiated end to the war, but an armistice to say, look, no one is going to win this war. Let's just, uh, well, even if somebody has achieved some military achievements, ultimately, they have to be sustainable. And that includes, of course, lifting sanctions on Russia. It has to be, you know, you have to give incentives. That's what diplomacy is all about. And the incentive for Ukraine is genius reconstruction funds, rebuilding the society, support uh, for all the damage which has been done. I mean, def definitely we hope to see an end to this war. I mean, at the end, they will have at the end to sit on a table and negotiate. Every war ends on a table to, uh, and, uh, and negotiations. Well, they'd say, they'd say that the Second World War didn't. It ended in complete victory. And don't forget, even the First World War, you had the armistice. And yet then the Western Allied, the Western Allied powers continued the blockade on Germany for nearly a year after the end of, of the armistice of November 1918. And in those nine odd months where the blockade continued, uh, you had hundreds of thousands of children died bloated of hunger. And no medicine, of course, and adults, and, you know, absolutely catastrophic, which established the feed uh, the, the feedstock for, as, as you alluded to earlier, the Second World War. So they would say, no, Nazi Germany had to be defeated. I agree with that view, by the way. Nazi Germany did have to be defeated and there, was, there could be no negotiation with Nazi Germany. And whereas Russia is not the equivalent of Nazi Germany, despite what Kiev, the ultra-nationalists in Kiev, would argue. Yeah, great point. The Russians are not the Nazis. So uh, the negotiations uh, gate uh, door all, is always open. Uh, Professor Sakwa, it has been an honor. Thank you so much and hope to see you more. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure and I wish you success in the future. Goodbye. 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 Thank you. <laughs>